I'll just put this at the beginning of the recording for any people who watch it on YouTube. Folks have asked me uh, about the last few weeks that we've met. They've watched for the videos on YouTube and there weren't any. And no, I did not record the videos for the last few weeks because we were talking about some sensitive, even though they're very timely, some very sensitive issues and folks were expressing themselves in an open way, which I appreciated. And I did not want that to become uh, something that's out in the public that people had to even think about the fact that something that they said that ends up on the internet would, might make them a target. So, um, so those sessions were not recorded or posted, but we're back to Bible study. This is recorded and it will be posted. So, um, how's everybody tonight? How are you tonight, Pastor? Um, I'm tired, actually. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, that's the, the honest answer is that yeah. I am tired. Um, yeah. These past couple months have, I mean, COVID, COVID was its own animal, but these past couple months have, have just magnified that in, in, in lots of different ways. So, um, but I'm, but I'm good. I'm tired, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So um, tonight we're going to tackle chapter eight and the title is Daughter, Your Faith Has Made You Well. So I'm going to open with uh, the opening prayer from this chapter. The Lord be with you. And also with you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. God, Son, and Holy Spirit, meet us in this space, whatever space we find ourselves in. Trinity, help us to learn more about who you are through this woman. Help us to see your image in the image bearer we find in this story. Help us to sympathize, grow, and lean into her story. Give us wisdom and gentleness with ourselves today. And I would add to that and every day in your name, we pray. Amen. So I, I, I think that many of us are familiar with the scripture that is the focus of, of this chapter. And it comes from Luke and I really should have pulled it up already, but let me do that. It comes from Luke, the eighth chapter. Um, not sure exactly what verses they, so they're, they're referencing verses 43 through 48. So, um, I think I might read that in a paraphrase, paraphrased version rather than the um, NRSV. Just a second. Yeah, so I'm going to read from the message uh, translation just to give a little different perspective from what's um, in the NRSV.
In the crowd that day, there was a woman who for 12 years had been afflicted with hemorrhages. She had spent every penny she had on doctors, but no one had been able to help her. She slipped in from behind and touched the edge of Jesus's rope. At that very moment, her hemorrhaging stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? When no one stepped forward, Peter said, but master, we've got crowds of people on our hands. Dozens have touched you. Jesus insisted, someone touched me. I felt power discharging from me. When the woman realized that she couldn't remain hidden, she knelt trembling before him. In front of all the people, she blurted out her story, why she touched him and how at that same moment she was healed. Jesus said, daughter, you took a risk trusting me and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed. So are there, I just like to send me, it's like, I don't know if, if you read it from the NRSV. And if you haven't, I mean, maybe I should read it from that version too and then ask this question. Yeah, I think I'll do that. So what, I just want you to listen for the differences in the translations and why you, and then we can talk about why you think they may be that way and we'll get into the meat of the lesson. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his clothes and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So before we, you know, get into the, the stuff in the chapter, it, it, is there anything that you notice, any differences uh, that stand out to you in those, between those two translations? They're pretty similar. Um, Ernestine, Ernestine, you're 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 muted. I'm mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I noticed the very first one it says something about you took a risk for doing this. It was not mentioned in the second one, and I'm not what kind of risk the person was talking about of being denied being pushed aside good question we I'll, I'll we can we can talk about that that's a good question what risk was she taking she was get, taking a risk of being uh -uh, we don't want to answer that yet uh -huh. we don't want to answer that yet Yvonne. don't jump ahead we uh -huh. just need questions uh -huh. right now <laughs> okay pastor hey i I'm sorry. <laughs> we just want to get some questions right there. <laughs> All right, sorry. I see you, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, I did see Jessica. That's her, right? In the yellow dress or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. guess. No, that's that's a very good question, uh, Ernestine. So so we can talk about that. Any anybody else um see it see or hear, you know, hear anything different? in that text, it, it differences between the two texts.
You were frozen, Jessica. <laughs> the New Living Translation. Um, What's that? New Living, the first one you read. So the first one I read was was the Message Translation. Yeah, it's it's um. It takes more explanation. Uh, you broke up, Yvonne. It was what? Oh gosh, I don't know what's happening with my phone. It's yeah, I, I'm saying it's it's much more easy to understand the New Living Translation. The Message Translation. Well, that's a, that's um that's a modern day translation. Um, it's it's pretty loose in most places. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a scholarly translation, but I like it because it gives a different slant. Yeah, yeah. It's not totally out of line. It's not, you know, it's not heretical, in other words. Anybody else notice anything different between the two translations that they want to call out? Okay, well, maybe something else will strike you as we move forward. So let's, again, be, before we delve into what the chapter writer says, let's address um, Ernestine's question about the risk. And so Yvonne, you had you had a quick response. So let's listen. I want to hear your response first. Uh, my response. Okay. Um, in the Jewish culture, when you're bleeding, either for 12 years or one day, you're considered unclean. And she took a risk because she could have stoned, I think. Because she could have what? She could have been stoned. I think because she is unclean. So when she she took a risk in going out there, um, you know, to touch Jesus's garment, and uh, she took a risk in going out in public. That, there you go. That she the risk that she took, the biggest risk that she took was that she was even out in public. She was quote unquote unclean. And unclean meant that you needed to separate yourself from everyone else. So just by just by her being in the presence of all those people, she took a risk because if there was someone there who knew that she had this particular issue and they pointed her out, like Yvonne said, she could have been stoned to death. So I, that's the risk. That's the risk that she took, and that is not like I think. Like that's kind of why I like le reading different translations of scripture, whereas we don't get that picture from the scripture we would normally read in church. Reading the message and the way he calls it out as risk puts a whole different view on on what she was, you know, it, it it highlights the fact that this was something totally out of the norm and not accepted in that in that society of that day. Pastor, could it also be because she was a woman reaching out to touch Jesus? I, I mean, it could be or could not be depending on like, depending on the writer's point of view. But at this point in the ministry of Jesus, there were plenty of other women who were in the quote unquote discipleship camp. So I'm not so sure that that would have been something that that would have been a big deal. Jessica. Um, I think I like the way that the um, NRSV version and some other versions are written because what it does is, yeah, the message indicates that it was a risk because it is, right? So the other, the other version doesn't really indicate the risk of, it doesn't point to like, this is how it is at the time. If you're bleeding, you're unclean. But the way that it, ends with 
your faith has made you whole or whatever it is, um, it indicates like, it indicates the woman's intention, I think, that like she didn't, she knew him saying that your faith did whatever she knew that just touching him was possibly enough to help her like she didn't need him to have she didn't need private time with him in a private room to talk to talk about what's wrong with her like she, there's this idea in the nrsv that all she had to do was touch him and that that, that might do something for her but see I, I hear what you're saying but truly if we just read this on the surface i mean like you're reading into it when you make those when you draw those conclusions if we just read what's on the surface um and the NRSV, I mean, I, I'd like to know, I, I, I'd like to explore that a little bit. Like what says that, that she had, like what says that faith propelled her to do this? Um, because everyone was touching him. Everyone wanted to touch him. Mm -hmm. He pointed out, he said, someone touched me. And then when Peter responded, but everybody's touching you, he's like, no, someone touched me and my power removed from me. So she obviously had to touch him in a way because I don't think she was the only person in the crowd who needed to be healed. And I don't think that Jesus is, I don't know. It, at this point, he's healed people. So he's not the type to be like, I'm going to heal you, but not you. Like there had to be a reason for him to say power has left me like that person touched him maybe wanting right. the power. So, so I'm gonna stop you there because he, see now you're making it about Jesus rather than about the woman. No, but that's what I mean. Like she touched him. This she didn't touch him the same way everybody else touched him. Like she I must have so, touched but him. But there's in nothing in, so that but that's just conjecture on your part. I'm talking about what the scripture is saying. The scripture doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. The scripture doesn't say she touched them in a different way. No, that's fair. Um, I don't know. It's just for Peter to point and, out. And the conversation that, that took place between him and Peter is separate from what's happening between him and this woman. I don't get that. So... She touched him and then he turned to Peter and said, this woman may not even agree, have to remember, there's a whole crowd of people. The mm -hmm. woman may not even have heard him, heard what he said to Peter. She didn't necessarily have to hear that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, and, and, okay. and there's nothing in scripture in this NRSV version or in any other translation. I read several of them today. There's nothing in any of them that says that she touched him any differently than anyone else in the crowd touched him. But that touch, and he didn't know who touched him. He just knew that there was a touch that drew power from him. But, because if he had known who it was, he could have just called her out right away, right? Okay, right. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't know that it was her until she came to him. But she, like, for her to say, "Why?" Because she, because the NRSV says she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him. Mm -hmm. Then, like. She had to have had a reason if she's explaining why she touched him. It wasn't, it couldn't have been, I just wanted to touch you. <laughs> like, then why would she come forward to explain why she touched him? Right. But then the 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 whole but 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 the the translation that I read the message says that she told her whole story. In the New Living Translation, it says like every place, every translation that I read today 
all says that this woman told her story. She bared, I mean, one, one translation says she bared her soul. Mm -hmm. So she did not hold back. Like, so whatever. So she said in our holy imagination, Hey, Jesus, I am at the end of my rope. I've had this problem for 12 years. I am bleeding. I have been bleeding for 12 years. I am not accepted in society. This is a huge and horrible burden to have to bear. And I have heard about you, Jesus. And I've heard about how you have cured other people and healed other people. So I'm here today because I feel like I know I need healing and I think you might be the one to do it. Okay. One more thing. One more thing. Okay. <laughs> I, I get that, but I think the difference in the translations then is it says in the NRSV that she touched him and she had been immediately healed. So she was healed without him even knowing her story. He was right. She was here without him knowing her story. Right. So I, but I'm just thinking but in, in, all, in all of the translations, she told her story. So to me, that's also very important because again, now, as we've talked about, as we walked with, as we have walked through this study, women for the most part are never identified by name in scripture. But scripture says that this woman told her whole story. Mm. That's important. Yeah. And there's no translation that I read where that was not mentioned. So that is the key part of right. this story. I think I was just thinking about the how like why other translations say your faith has made you well or your faith has made you whole. Because to me, that just indicates that he was recognizing her faith. She had to have faith in something, but the way it's written doesn't indicate faith in what, you know? And right. and, I, and truthfully, <laughs> um, and I, I did not do a translation, but I just think that that's a bad translation to say your faith has made you well, because at this particular point in time, it's faith is faith in Jesus Christ is not a thing yet. I mean, you know, the early church movement hasn't even started yet. Mm -hmm. So again, like I said, you know, we cannot take scripture outside of history. Hey, kiddo. Oh, what's going down? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, so, um, so the fact that, you know, this, this event here, I mean, I, for me, the linchpin of this event is the fact that she told her whole story and nobody stoned her. Like nobody called her out and said, oh, you shouldn't even have been here in the beginning. You need to be punished for what you did. Like that didn't happen. And that's what should have happened at that point in time. So this really is a miracle story. And Jesus calls it out as the miracle that it is by call, you know, by saying, you know, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. And, and 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 the crowds do nothing. You know, so that's so so it's to me it it's a it it's a multi-level miracle, not just the miracle that the woman was healed, but a miracle that there was nothing else that transpired that really could have and maybe even should have at that point. Well, Pastor Joy. Okay, so Joy, she... Joy, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you speak, and then June after Joy. The Go fact ahead, Joy. that the woman came out and told the story, and I'm sure she realized that one thing: if people knew she was bleeding, 
that there would be a problem. But the fact that Jesus said you're healed and accepted her and mentioned about her faith, that may be and one of the things that kept the crowd from going crazy. The fact no. that she had the courage to tell her story. No. No. I, I, I mean, so, I mean, you know, we, we, we domesticate these biblical stories because of the way that they've been taught to us. The truth of the matter is, it was a miracle that it, like we can't explain, like the crowd would not just have been automatically subdued just because Jesus said something. No, because there were people like, we read all through the ministry of Jesus. There were always people who were there who were not friends of Jesus. There were always people there who were trying to discredit Jesus. So to tell this nice story about this thing happening and think that there was nobody in the crowd who would want to stone this woman means that we're denying history. And, and, and that doesn't do scripture any justice because the truth of the matter, like I said, I'm going to keep calling this, there was not just one miracle that happened. <laughs> there were several miracles that happened in in the telling of this story the one we're concentrating on is this woman being healed but there were several miracles that happened june um piggybacking from what jessica had said the way i see it or the way i read into it she knew of jesus she knew that if she came out in public, she could be stoned because that was how it was back then. But I think she also knew that if she could just get close to Jesus and just touch him, that she could be healed. And she took that risk. But, but she didn't know that because you no, no one in that time could have known that for sure. So, you know, because if she knew it, there was no risk involved, right? Well, there could have been risk because if the well, people had there found was her out that she wasn't the outside the city where she should have been. I mean, like that's because 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 of her condition, she shouldn't have been in contact with any other people. Right. She should have been isolated. And it's not so much. It wasn't necessarily so much about her faith in quote unquote Jesus. She had heard the Jesus stories and she knew he had been healing other people. And she's like, well, what do I have to lose? Either I get stoned or I get healed. Right? Yeah. I mean, so, so the thing is for, for us, I think, and not that it's not a wonderful story. And, and, you know, I believe it's a wonderful story, but the thing for us when we're looking at scripture and delving in is not to put more on scripture than what's actually there. Jessica, I see you busting. There. Okay. So, okay. This is why it's confusing, not confusing. I, I, a thousand percent understand what you're saying and where you're coming from. But, okay, in reading the like summary and then seeing where she took it. So she takes it out of Mark, right? And then if, why is it that then? Wait, 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 wait. Help she, me, help me you're it. talking about the, the author of this chapter. Right, so okay. help me. Help me understand why oh, this is a hard question to ask, because when I read it in Mark, I read it in a different translation. The translation I read it in was, and I know it's really like you shouldn't read that one, but in King James. Oh, no, we're not reading. <laughs> I just I don't know. 
Okay, wait, let me see if it comes up in another version because it's so clear in Mark. It's like written differently than in Luke. No, absolutely. So, so Mark, where did, where does, where does it come up in Mark? Let's, let's investigate that. Okay. So in Mark, uh, five, 25 to 34. Let me read it again. Okay. Okay. So I I just read it. 25 to um four. Uh yeah. 25. Yeah, 25 to 34. Mm hmm So not the King James Version in the NIV, because that's what I generally read, right? Okay. Why is it that Luke I mean, Mark says, um, if you look at verse 28. I'm pulling it up now so I can look at them parallel. Okay. So you said the NIV, right? Yeah, the NIV in Mark 5, verse 28. I think this is why I thought the way, because this is just how I've read it before. Oh, yeah. See, in this, this chapter of Mark. Um, it's so weird. Jesus, so... Is just, Jesus is just casting out all kinds of demons. And <laughs> so, so I don't understand. Look, considering the writers, why does Mark indicate, like, why is he specific in changing her story to say, like, if I can just touch him, I know I'll be healed. Whereas in Luke, he just kind of, like, says what happens. Oh, such a wonderful question. Can anybody answer that? <laughs> All of you folks who attended the parallels. Who was the audience? Because of the audience he was talking to. Thank you. Was so here's the, here's the difference between, I mean, you know, you were with us for some of those, Jessica, the differences in the gospel. That's why I don't get it. Like, wouldn't Luke, because he's the... Uh, historian like tell the story and mark is doing the, nope, the so the, nope. am i wrong so, that Matthew? Matthew? so luke luke was luke luke's profession was what oh dang no i got it wrong he's <laughs> so luke is talking to the gentiles right no yeah who's who talking to folks word i don't even know I nope. just, <laughs> anybody <laughs> remember he was talking to the gentiles also Okay, Luke but, was talking to the Gentiles. Was a different the Gentiles. A different perspective. I think maybe the fact that he was a doctor. That's, that's why. What I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if he's a doctor, why would he not have some sort of explanation as to why she's touching him? <laughs> but Mark, who keeps everything short and simple, is like, let me elongate this story and add all this other stuff that this. So, who was Mark's audience? Gentiles. No, who was Mark's audience? We are talking about Luke. Who was Mark's audience? Jews. Oh, Jews. Jews. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So he had, to, he had to give a reason. He had to he, indicate. Exactly. Okay. He had to line it all out for them in order for them to understand why, why she didn't get stoned. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, so, I mean, so this... Thank you so much for that, because this is the thing that we always have to hold in tension. And this is the kind of stuff that we can't flesh out on Sunday morning, you know, in worship. But it's important to know who the writer was, what their perspective was, and then who were they talking to? Because that totally impacts the way the story is presented. 
I mean, there are several stories. You know, that's what we marched through them as we went through those parallel gospels where each gospel writer tells the story in a slightly different manner because of the audience that they're delivering this information to. So thanks, Jessica. Thanks for taking us back to what we already did. Refresh your, don't, don't forget what we've already learned. Pastor, one quick question, sorry. Sure, who, who was Mark's audience? I, I missed that. I, I'm babysitting, so I'm over. So who Mark's Mark? audience was Jewish people. The Jew, that's what you said, the Jewish people. Okay. Yes. Okay, makes sense. All right, thanks, Pastor. You're welcome. So that's like, so that, that's, that's why the difference, you know, and, and so, I mean, if you don't have a parallel Bible, I'd say like, that's one of the best investments that folks who are really serious about Bible study can, can, um, can get. And even if you don't have, I mean, it doesn't have to be a whole parallel. If you can just get a parallel of the gospels because those are those are truly the only only the the gospels are the only stories that are repeated in the gospel yeah we have repetition like where there's parts of the gospels where jesus pulls stuff from you know from from the ancient texts and what have you but for the most part the four gospels are are the ones that you would want to look at in parallel and as you're looking at them in parallel, you will see differences. And so then questions should go off. It's like, okay, who, who was Mark? What did he do? And who was he talking to? Like, those are the first questions you should ask. And lots of times those just being able to answer those questions for yourself will explain why Mark's slant is one way, Matthew's is another, Luke's is another, and John is whole otherworldly, <laughs> right? So great question, Jessica. So now let's um, end, this, end this chapter because some of you've already mentioned some things and you've we've had this chapter for a long time because we put off going into it for a while. Um, what, what questions came up for you? What things stood out for you? Um, before we get into, you know, into her conclusion. I mean, I like the fact that the writer of this chapter points out the significance of the number 12. That whole um, A, B, A thing and how she talked about the story of the girl, um, the little girl, and then she points out all the similarities. Never thought of it like that, mm -hmm. but it makes me appreciate it even more because of all the similarities because they're both unnamed because of the 12 years old 12 years because of all this stuff and then it really got me like i was crying when when he said when the writer says that um jesus refers to both of them as daughter because he knew that that's something that they both needed lost it it was so beautiful mm -hmm. um but yeah i just never never put the two stories together um, in that way. And that was just really dope, so. Yeah, um, that is, um, I mean, it's not by accident, you know, that those, I, I don't believe it's by accident that those two stories made it into, into scripture. And they're both very powerful stories. And yes, they do have similarities. Um, 
And I know in, in the past, I, I have, I have preached on that. I can't tell you exactly what I preached on, you know, I, without going back and looking at my manuscript, but it definitely is, um, it's very powerful to compare those, you know, to, to com compare and combine those images. <clears throat> Anything else? Any questions? Hi, Pastor. Um, for me, um, in the conclusion, what touched me was when it says, um, but sometimes healing looks like acceptance, belonging, and connection. That it's not necessarily, you know, uh, being healed or being cured, but by simply accepting a situation, an action, or even belonging, you know, sometimes right. you're left out, sometimes, you know, you're rejected, but having that feeling of belonging, you know, I never thought of healing in those three words other than being healed or you go to the doctor, they fixed you up or, but even the word connection, you know, there's a sort of healing, which is what I drew to the story. She touched the garment, the hem of his garment. It was a connection. Mm -hmm. So that's what I got from, you know, uh, from this, what it, what it really looks, you know, a different form of what healing looks like. Absolutely. Because, you know, in, in, in our, in, in our humanity, in our, in, in our human uh, uh, you know, it, I'll just say in our humanity, you know, like we we have a way of of thinking. I mean, you know, and this is the way we're acculturated. Also, you know, healing means you know, healing and cure are synonymous, right? And you know, it, it, in my days of being a chaplain in a hospital, in a trauma center, I came quickly. I mean, and I mean like in, after being on the job one or two days and baptizing dying babies and visiting people in burn units who were dying, actively dying and, and come to understand that healing does not necessarily mean cure. Cured. Yeah. Because I truly believe that, you know, as folks left this life to move into the next, they received their healing. You know, so we we have one way of thinking about it. And, you know, when we pray for healing, which is like for me, that's why I always pray for healing. I don't pray for cure. I always pray mm -hmm. for healing. But healing does not necessarily look like what we imagine it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, often when we when we're saying healing, we want that person to be physically well and stay with us, right? Yeah, that's what we mean. But God's understanding is not the same as ours, mm -hmm. and healing can take on all kinds of forms. I believe. And so, um, and so like, so, you know, so for me, my, my big question in this story is like, when she approached Jesus, was her desire to be, to have that illness go away? I mean, like, was that her desire? Yes. To have no, the I'm not, no, I'm so. Uh, and and I'm not so sure that that was her desire. We don't know. We weren't there. We don't know her. <laughs> her. And, you know, even though she told her whole story, I believe that, you know, maybe her, des in my holy imagination, her, her, her desire could have just been take this away from me or let me die. Probably. Healing, I mean, because for her, healing could have been take this away or let me die because the existence that she had to, you know, that she had was I, having to stay isolated from everyone. Like what kind of existence is that? Right. 
So in my holy imagination, I think it could have been either one of those things. Either one of those things could have been fine with her. If she had touched Jesus and died on this spot, that would have been okay. I, I got you, Pastor. I got you. Um, uh, they were asking in the discussion question about the story of healing in your own life. Could have said to herself, is either or when I touch her, I'm going to die. Either or is healing because the existence, or she was just existing. I remember when my mom was sick, she had diabetic complications and she had Alzheimer's. And when I see my mom, my vibrant mom, I down, can't do nothing for herself, just staring. I asked God, I did. I asked God, I said, God, if you're not going to heal her, which I didn't think at that point, she was going to get physically healed. Take her. Take her. I was, I, I cried, but not that much because I felt a relief when my mother died because she was, she, she, she was just existing. So I prayed for God to take her. I mean, you know, like I said, you know, healing. And I think that that's, for, especially for, for, for those of us who, who are followers of Christ, I, and I would say not just followers of Christ, people of faith, period. I think that um, the way that we present healing to the rest of the world could probably heal a lot of Ill, ills in the world. You know, instead of presenting healing as always being a cure, it's like there's so many ways that healing happens. I mean, you know, I, and I, I mean, I can say some of, some of you know that I'm a two-time cancer survivor. And I mean, and there, I mean, with the first time, the my, my first diagnosis, I was, I mean, I was told, you know, frankly, that in two years I was going to be dead. You know, there was no cure. And, and if I didn't, you know, and even in, in my own research, and this was before internet, I mean, I spent hours and hours in libraries and calling people and doing all kinds of, it's like, well, either I'm going to die right after I have surgery or I'm going to linger for a little bit and I'm going to die anyway, <laughs> because at that point for the type of surgery, type of cancer I had, like there's no cure and nobody who, pe most people who had this form of cancer all ended up dying. Either they died right away <laughs> or they lingered and they died, but they died. So, you know, my resolve was just that I'm not going to, you know, um, I, I don't want to end up bedridden and just waste away. So my thing is like, no, I'm not going to have any surgery. I'm just going to live until this thing takes me away. And, you know, and so, but for me, that was the healing. The healing was just in making that decision that I was going to live no, whether my whether my days of living was a year or two years or beyond, I'm going to live until I die. That was healing for me, for me to just get to the point where I could make that statement out loud and mean it. So healing comes in lots of ways. And I think that, you know, again, I, I just feel that as people of faith, if we can wrap our heads around that and then shine that out into the world, mm -hmm. then we can help change the world when it comes to that because we're so narrow. Even though we say we have faith, we, like, we put God in our box Instead of understanding that God doesn't have a box.
God, God doesn't have a box. You know, we say that we 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 know that we God's ways are not like our ways, but then we keep trying to bring God in to our ways. Mm-hmm. 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 So, I mean, for me in in this story, and I, you know, I, and I I don't know about you. I I hope I hope in some ways yeah, I think in some ways we all have had some experiences in our lives where we can can feel connected to um, this story of this of this woman. Maybe you know, our issue doesn't have to be an issue of hemorrhaging. It could be any number of things, but I'm sure that we've all had those kinds of sto- we all have those kinds of stories, and so like a story of physical restoration, but what about a story of restoration period? (laughs) And, and, and then, and then when, and then, and then what do you do with your restoration? (laughs) You know, do you just go on about, about living your life and, you know, or is that for you a testimony that you choose to share with others to help them see? I mean, because, you know, I always feel like the stories that we don't tell, we never know how they could, what kind of impact they could have on others. You're in the Africa. Africa. Oh, you know, um, you know, we don't do this a lot in our tradition, but you know, I was raised in a tradition where you know every Sunday morning part of worship was testimony. Because I, I mean, I truly believe if you can't see where God is working in your life, why do you come to church? Why do you pray? So whether it's comfortable for everyone to testify is, is another thing. But I feel like you know, if you if 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 you know for yourself that God you know, is is active in your life and you can see where God is moving, not just in your life, but all around you, then to say one thing that you've seen, God, you know, like, you know, my, my thing with, with confirmation kids and with Sunday school kids, I always, I ask them like, so where do you see God? And kids are always anxious to tell, oh, I see God in the trees. I see God, I mean, it's like, and so why is that so hard for us? You know, as we get older, you know, we <laughs> mature and we have a harder time talking about where we see God. And this woman, she was unashamed. She had no shame whatsoever. Her thing is like, I believe what I've heard the stories about this man. I believe he is from God. I believe that if I can get close enough to him, something's going to change for me. Either I'm going to be taken out of my misery and die, or I'm going to be healed. I mean, that's the way I see this woman's story because there's nothing in scripture that tells me or even makes me think that she believed that just because she got close to Jesus, that her issue was going to go away. I believe that what she, what she believed was she was going to be healed and whether that meant dead or alive, healing was going to happen for her.
And so, and so that's why I, I encourage you to look at healing a little differently. And instead of in, in, equating healing with cure, really like investigate what it means to be healed and the things that we can be healed from. We can be healed from bad relationships. We can be healed from financial disasters. I mean, like healing takes all kinds of forms that we don't necessarily equate with healing. We, we tend to equate healing with something physical in our body. And I would like you to expand the way you think about healing. And know that it just, it doesn't have to just be something physical. Pastor. Yes. For me, healing is also not just asking for a cure, but asking for the strength to upset whatever happens. I mean, like every time I get on an airplane, um, I say my little prayer and I say, you know, I'm not asking that nothing happens, but if something has to happen, give me the strength to deal with it. So that is a way of healing also. Absolutely. Thank you, June. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I have something. Sure. So this whole time, I think the Holy Spirit was like nudging me and there's no, you know, accidents or mistakes or anything like that. So this whole story of the woman, it's just so beautiful. And then all this talk about testimony and stuff. So I don't know that many people know that uh, I've experienced loss before, like um, pregnancy loss. And I remember going, talking to pastor, I came to your house for like a few minutes to get something. And you're like, just listen, just get a bottle of wine and just make it happen. Like, don't think too much about it, you know? And I didn't know that at the time I was expecting. And then like a couple of weeks later, I went to the doctor and found out that it was another loss. And I did, I just felt like, okay, this isn't for me. So like, my prayers became if I can't, if I can't physically have children, then like, Lord, if you can't, if you're not going to heal whatever's happening inside, like just allow me to accept what's happening and let me see motherhood in a different way. And um, then weeks later, I go to the doctor and I'm pregnant and thank God to this day, I'm still pregnant, um, 19 weeks pregnant today, no. um, but I was, something didn't feel right because I felt like, oh God, you answered my prayer. But then whenever that would like come into my mind, I would be mourning every loss before that. And I mm -hmm. thought that because I'm where I am now in a healthier situation, I wouldn't even be thinking about that. So there was maybe a cure, but there wasn't healing because I wasn't able to heal from the trauma of the numbers of losses before. Mm -hmm. And literally yesterday full panic mode texted my therapist who's also a spiritual advisor and she said something to me about the holy spirit and about telling my story and i went back and forth like is this something i need to share with people i know people struggle with this but it's not a thing i don't know if it's something to share and then reading what that woman wrote to what wrote in the summary of this scripture, when she said that 
these two women, the little girl and this woman with the issue needed to be called daughter because that's what they needed to hear. And this whole time, I feel like that's just, that's what I needed to hear in order for healing to begin. Like I need to get closer to God and remind myself that I'm his daughter and that I can be healed and I will be healed and I am healed and all that stuff. So like, it's just really just wonderful how the Holy Spirit works, how it all kind of circles back. This obviously wasn't for me in this moment, but it feels like it. Like it feels like the Holy Spirit was super intentional about this, this study right now. So that's, I'm going to crack. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica, for, for sharing that. Thank you. And that is such a perfect example of what we are talking about. And um, so I just, I, I thank you. I thank you for, for sharing that. And I continue to pray with you. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I just, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what struck, what, what, what's striking me. It's like, there have, so, so I'm going to ask, first, I'm going to ask permission, whether, I mean, because, you know, if, is it okay that, that, that I post this video to our, to our YouTube? Because, you know, whenever we share really intimate things, I, I want to be sensitive to the fact that maybe you don't want it living on the internet forever because once it goes on YouTube, it's going to be there forever. Um, but it all it, it it always strikes me that since we've been in this study, we've had our most intimate conversations when there haven't been any men present. <laughs> I just, I'm, I, I, I'm just saying, I just, I, he's laughing, I, I've he's noticed that, I mean, there. Oh, Tony's still here. Okay, <laughs> I I couldn't see you, Tony. I know. I he was I, listening. I, I am always listening. If I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, so so yeah. I mean, you know, these I think these stories of these women, and, and again, you know, I I solicit your prayers, uh, continuing prayers, because. I'm seriously thinking about as we enter the next liturgical year, starting with Advent, that I'm going to do a whole year of like, I will go off lectionary and just do a whole year of women's biblical stories to, to guide my preaching for a year because folks who don't come to Bible study don't get to hear these stories. And I think that these stories are really important for our faith life as well. And so this study has kind of moved me to, um, I've done that. It's been a, a good number of years before I, since I have done it and I never did it as a whole year. I may have just had seasons where I took three or four Sundays and concentrated on women's stories. But, um, but I know from my research that there are more than enough stories about women in scripture to fill, we could fill several years. So I think, I mean, if I decide I'm just gonna take one liturgical year to do it. So just continue to pray with me about that because I'm working on formulating something and we'll see where the Holy Spirit leads with that. So anybody else, any anything else that struck you? I see Joy, you unmuted yourself. Yes, well, Pastor, no, all I was saying is healing with me came, like I told people, when my husband passed, the Lord had me with him the whole while and could see the suffering. And my healing was the fact that I was able to accept it with God's help, accept the fact that he would not be with me much longer. But it was for both our good. And so I think for me, that was a healing because a lot of people say, well, Joy, you don't look like you. I say, the Lord let me through this. And he said, Joy, you have to move forward. And that's what I tried to do. 
Thank you, Joy. And, and, and I must admit, Pastor, a lot of things you have said have helped me to move through that. And as I keep telling you, I, that I'm, I really appreciate it. I, I, I'm not trying to feed off you or anything like that, but I just have to let people know they need to listen. And like I was telling somebody the other day, you listen. I mean, I've had experiences on top of experiences. So I, and, and I'm, like I say, you're never too old to learn. Amen. And like I keep telling people, listen, the thing you have to do though is listen. Because a lot of people, they hear, but they're not really listening. And that's important. You must listen. And, and I really thank you. And I thank all of the people who join us, who give, and Jessica, congratulations to you. And I will certainly keep you in prayer because, but don't worry child, the Lord has you in his hand and you and baby will come through. Trust me. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me speak. Amen. Anybody else? So yeah, so healing, healing is its own thing and it doesn't ever look, I, I believe it doesn't ever look the same as we all are unique, our healings are also unique. And, and so I, I think that, that when, you know, there's, as I was, you know, weeks ago when we were first supposed to do this chapter and I was studying and I was reading a lot about how, you know, people compare their stories. It's just like, it's just like this thing about diagnosis. You know, people compare, like say, oh, well, you know, COVID, like we've all been, we, we've been dealing with, well, I had COVID and this happened to me. Oh, well, I had COVID and it was really, you know, everybody's experience is different. None of us, we don't have the, we don't live in the same bodies. Each of our bodies is different, right? And so to think that our healings are going to look exactly the same is really not, it, it, it's not accepting the uniqueness that God has created in each one of us. So I, I think that, you know, we all would do well just to embrace that healing looks different all the time. Even our own healings look different because as we move through life, as we grow in faith, as we deepen our discipleship, the world and the rest of our lives look it looks different so um so if we can do that for ourselves i think that we do ourselves a lot of justice to be open enough to accept again i think it's kind of like we let's not put god in our box Let's kind of look at the box and say, okay, God, which corner are you in? Where do I need to navigate to now? You know? So as always, you know, I'm thankful that you show up and I'm thankful that we get to spend this time together and, um, you know, I've said this over and over again, and some people appreciate it and others don't, but this is really the most fun part of ministry for me because not only do I get to share with you all some things that I don't get a chance to share in worship, but it also keeps me sharp because it sends me back to the books and to researching and 
to digging into the text in a way that I don't get a chance to do um, as I prepare for worship. You know, because worship is its own animal, but Bible study is where we really get to experience the richness of scripture that we really can't uncover. And you know, worship is is worship has its purpose, and that worship is not Bible study. So I thank you all for showing up and giving me a chance to keep myself sharp as I um, help us march through through these texts. So is any is are all hearts and minds clear? Anyone have anything else that they want to lift up? So next week, um, first, let me look at my calendar and make sure that, yep, next week we are meeting. So we will go to chapter nine, um, which is that the last chapter in this book? I think it is. So two things for next week. So next week we will do chapter nine, which will be the end of this study. And let's talk about, so we'll, 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 we'll tackle that, but then also kind of come prepared with where you think you might want to see us go for the next study. I mean, I have some ideas. I have some things in the works, but I want to hear from you first, because what I know is that when we do what you want to do in Bible study, you show up. And that's what's important to me. So, um, so next Sunday, it's, I mean, next Wednesday, it's turning tragedy into triumph, one woman's vigil for justice. And um, it's an interesting story. So all hearts and minds are clear. All hearts and minds are clear. Uh, Deacon Yvonne, can I ask you to lead us out in prayer? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Almighty and ever living God, we, we thank you for this day that you have made and we are still rejoicing and we are glad in it, oh God, because you brought us together as sisters and brothers in Christ um, to know more about your word, uh, to teach one another. Um, I'm grateful for Pastor. She has opened up, oh my gosh, a, a, a new way of looking at Bible study. And I am so grateful because I, I have learned so much. Um, I think last week I talked about my aunt being a witness and the fact that I didn't know a lot. And I tell you, I have, I have grown. I have grown for the past two years and I thank you for pastor. And I just ask you, Father God, to, to, to continue to be the lamp, to, the lamp to our feet and the light to our path, that you continue to guide us and I pray, Lord, that uh, my brothers and sisters will be on board um, with Pastor to continue to not only lift you up, but to make Good Shepherd the, the, the richest, the richest church biblically. So, God, we thank you tonight. Um, we ask you, God, for, for um, favor on each and every one of our lives. Um, favor in all aspects of, of our lives, Lord, I ask you. And I ask you to continue to strengthen my pastor and continue to give her the vision of bringing us as a congregation, bringing us um, to where we need to be as, as, as Lutherans and also as people in the community. So God, I just thank you for for this hour that we spent together, and we are looking forward to many more Bible study. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just want to say, Barbara and Regina, I see you. I don't hear you, but I see you. 
Thank you for being here. So have a great night, everybody, and a good rest of the week. And I will see you in worship on Sunday, hopefully. Um, if you can't make it to the sanctuary, um, I, I hope that you can be there on Zoom. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.